It's hard to find the words to describe the forms that lie across this landscape. Forests of stone, amphitheaters of rock. It's as if drip castles made of sand and water were dolloped here by giant children. But these red and pink spires do have a name. They're called hoodoos, which seems like the perfect word given that they could easily be at home in the movie Return of the Jedi. Years of rain and water lash this landscape of limestone rocks, leaving these otherworldly shapes. Imagine trying to raise animals here. That's what a Mormon pioneer named Ebenezer Bryce did. He was the first to settle in this area in 1875. Bryce tried to rear cattle among the hoodoos and reportedly said that this canyon was one hell of a place to lose a cow. Now the cattle are gone and the thrilling canyon bears his name. But despite its dry desert landscapes, Utah is a land of endless surprises and the Glen Canyon National Recreation Area is one of them. Rivaling Arizona's Grand Canyon for sheer majesty, Utah's Glen Canyon leaves those who see it similarly speechless. Images of this landscape can look like those that rovers might send back to Earth from distant planets. Except here, there's lots of water, including these turquoise ribbons in a place called Mokui Canyon. one of the most beautiful places in the entire state. At the turn of the 20th century, Kitty Hawk wasn't much more than just a place to go fishing. But two brothers saw its open space and soft dunes as the perfect spot to experiment with their flying machines. Wilbur and Orville Wright, who ran a bicycle shop in Ohio, spent their winters down here. In wooden shacks like these, they lived humbly and worked on a series of primitive gliders. In the winter of 1903, they were finally prepared to take to the air in an engine-powered craft. On December 14th, after a coin toss, Wilbur won the privilege of piloting their new Wright Flyer down this path. But instead of catching air, he oversteered the plane, which dove into the sand before it could take off. Three days later, Orville was in the pilot's seat for his short but historic flight. For 12 incredible seconds, at this exact location, human flight went from fantasy to reality. The Wright's flyer traveled just 120 feet, but its impact was felt around the world. In the distance on Big Kill Devil Hill stands the 60-foot Wright Brothers Monument. Dedicated in 1932, it bears the inscription, in commemoration of the conquest of the air by the brothers Orville and Wilbur Wright. Conceived by genius, achieved by dauntless resolution, and unconquerable faith. The slow but powerful rhythms that define Mississippi begin with the river that gives the state its name. Called Father of Waters by the Native American Ojibwe tribe, the Mississippi rolls some 2,350 miles through the heartland of America. Virtually every raindrop that falls between the Appalachian Mountains and the Continental Divide eventually finds its way down this mythic waterway. The river's course, in most places, marks Mississippi's western border. It moves goods, deposits fertile soil, and has played a strategic role in history. But when the big muddy overflows its banks, it ravages crops, homes, and lives. In 2011, the Mississippi broke all records when the surge rose higher than 57 feet. The flood swept inland more than 60 miles, swamping golf courses and houses. But it's farmers that bear the brunt. 
This year, Mississippi farms had more than $250 million in losses. But it could get a whole lot worse. When the river floods, water seeps through the levees and even tops over them. But if these man-made barriers give way, millions could be affected. Luckily for now, Mississippi's levees are holding. Whenever water rises, livestock head for high ground. Wild animals, like this American alligator, can be swept away by floodwaters. Some have even been known to wash into people's living rooms. But high water doesn't touch these colonies of herons and egrets. In the treetops of this forested floodplain, they're right at home. From the air, it's possible to get a rare view of these nesting birds, which are usually only spotted standing solitary in shallow waters. For people, flooding inflicts tremendous losses. The water can take weeks to recede. But for the 12,000 years that humans have occupied this land, they have accepted the river's dangers in exchange for its gifts. A rocket towers high over the Alabama city of Huntsville. It's a Saturn V, the most powerful launch vehicle ever sent into space. The story of how Huntsville came to be known as Rocket City begins at a former military base just outside of town. In 1945, at the end of World War II, the U.S. government smuggled a group of German scientists into the United States to keep them out of Russian hands. It was a program codenamed Operation Paperclip. One of those scientists, named Dr. Werner von Braun, had worked to develop rockets for Hitler. The U.S. government wanted his expertise, despite his Nazi sympathies. So starting in 1950, von Braun worked here on the grounds of the U.S. Army's Redstone Arsenal. He led a team of German and American scientists to develop a rocket that could, one day, carry humans into space. In 1958, President Eisenhower signed legislation to create NASA which soon established the Marshall Space Center here at Redstone, NASA's first home. By the late 1960s, Von Braun's team had tested 32 of their Saturn designs. Not a single one failed. Finally, in 1969, powered by a Saturn V, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin lifted off and became the first to set foot on the moon. Thanks to the Marshall Space Center, Huntsville is also home to one of the biggest concentrations of high-tech companies in the country. Siemens, Boeing, and a wide range of other aerospace-related firms whose names are less familiar to the public all call Huntsville home. Huntsville continues to live up to its nickname, Rocket City. Inside the McMorrow Missile Laboratories, scientists develop a wide range of missiles for military use. And the nearby Huntsville Airport is still a place to see amazing flying machines. Like this Boeing Dreamlifter, one of the highest capacity cargo planes in the world. The fortunes of many in Alabama are still soaring on the frontier of space exploration. There may be no place in America with stranger aviation stories than this. Welcome to Roswell, New Mexico, where aircraft come to die. Anyone frustrated by the current state of air travel might want to try their hand at this, tearing apart an entire airplane. This hydraulic excavator has been outfitted with a special giant claw that can demolish a once mighty MD-80 jet in minutes. This might just be one of the most satisfying jobs in aviation, but it takes a lot of skill. You try plucking out the plane's bathroom as neatly as this. When this aircraft is completely demolished, workers will salvage spare parts for resale. Next up, this 747. But aircraft demolition isn't the only strange sight here at the Roswell Airport. Across the tarmac, is a red Lockheed Jetstar, 
that once belonged to the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley himself. It was first sold by Elvis's dad, and then sold again to a man from Poland, but still gathers dust here in Roswell. And then there's the strangest flying object of them all. So strange, no one has actually ever seen it. Almost 60 years ago, an unidentified flying object reportedly landed in the desert outside Roswell. Before anyone knew what it was, the U.S. government locked it away in this hangar at the Roswell Airport. Rumors that it was an alien spaceship spread like wildfire, sealing Roswell's extraterrestrial reputation. Nearly a mile across and over 500 feet deep, for the longest time, it was assumed to be a volcanic crater. It wasn't until the 1960s that it was confirmed to have a more celestial, yet just as explosive origin. 50,000 years ago, as woolly mammoths and giant ground sloths wandered these lands, a massive asteroid collided here. The impact energy was about 10 megatons, equivalent to more than 20 million tons of TNT. Named simply Meteor Crater, it's the first geologic scar ever confirmed to have been created by a collision from outer space. Hundreds of other craters have been identified since, but Arizona's remains one of the most spectacular. A dusty ribbon reaches to the horizon. It may not look like much, but it's one of the most legendary roads in America. Route 66. John Steinbeck was the first to dub this route the Mother Road in his famous novel, The Grapes of Wrath. Commissioned in 1926, it ran from the Midwest across the Great Plains to California, cutting the drive from Chicago to Los Angeles by 200 miles. In Oklahoma, the new highway used existing primitive roads like this one, called the Ribbon Road, a nine-foot wide stretch just big enough for passing Model Ts that plied the new Route 66 in the 1920s and 30s. It wouldn't have been able to reach California without bridges like this one. The now historic Pony Bridge was completed in 1933. Named for the steel pony trusses that were used to build it, for Oklahomans, it was finished just in time. Within just five years, thousands of Depression-era migrants packed all their belongings into whatever vehicles they had and crossed the Pony Bridge, fleeing Oklahoma and its Dust Bowl devastation to search for jobs and a better life. For those early travelers and others, roadhouses and gas stations were their lifeline. And there may be no fuel stop on Route 66 more famous than this one, Lucille's Place. Lucille Hammonds and her husband Carl opened this rest stop in 1941. When times got hard, as they often did, Lucille would trade gas for whatever weary travelers had to offer. That's how she earned the nickname Mother of the Mother Road. But as America's interstate highway system snaked across the land, Lucille's Place and Route 66 were rendered obsolete. Though that hasn't put an end to nostalgia for this historic highway or new rest stops along the way. This is the largest area of protected wilderness in the continental United States. The Adirondack Park covers 6.1 million acres, one-fifth of New York State. It's nearly eight times the size of California's Yosemite. Unlike most mountain ranges, the Adirondacks are not strung out in a chain. Instead, they're formed as a giant dome 160 miles wide. This region was once flat, but five million years ago, giant forces from below pushed up rock and soil, creating the Adirondacks peaks and valleys. They are almost as impenetrable today as they were 400 years ago. The Adirondack Park's lakes and streams are some of the country's hidden treasures, but one is well known around the world. 
Lake Placid was the site of one of the greatest events in American sports history. It was here during the Winter Olympics in 1980 when the U.S. hockey team, made up largely of amateur players, beat the Soviets in what's been called the Miracle on Ice. Deep in these mountains, the headwaters of the Hudson River were discovered in 1872. But by then, it was another waterway to the west that was about to power the cities and towns of New York State. Many of New York's tallest skyscrapers today were built during the period of fierce competition between developers in the early 20th century. 40 Wall Street, with its distinctive copper roof, was once the tallest building in the world when it was completed in 1930, a title it held for only a few weeks. That's because Walter Chrysler was already building his own now famous skyscraper uptown at 405 Lexington Avenue. After 40 Wall Street opened its doors, Chrysler hoisted a secretly built spire onto the top of his building's Art Deco crown, topping out 40 Wall Street by 120 feet. But Chrysler's achievement was short-lived, too. Less than a year later, the new, even higher Empire State Building was completed after just 14 months of construction. The Empire State Building hasn't always been the tallest structure in Manhattan, but it is again today, after what many have called the greatest tragedy in American history. These are the footprints of the Twin Towers. On September 11, 2001, clouds of ash engulfed Lower Manhattan. After terrorist attacks brought down the city's tallest buildings, the towers of the World Trade Center. It happened here at Ground Zero. Nearly 3,000 people died in the attack, including 343 firefighters. Now, the footprints of the World Trade Center are being turned into reflecting pools, memorials to those who perished. And New York City's skyline is about to change again. A new tower is rising above ground zero. More than a thousand workers are building America's tallest skyscraper. It's the largest construction site in the country. One World Trade Center, also known as the Freedom Tower, will rise a symbolic 1,776 feet. Even before the Wright brothers took off in their first plane, Kansans were already dreaming of flight. The first efforts at manned flight in the state date back to the late 1800s. The first commercially produced airplane in the United States made its debut over Wichita in 1920. By the end of the decade, groundbreaking Wichita aviation pioneer Lloyd Stearman was designing biplanes like these and designing them so well that almost 90 years later, they're still taking wing. But in the 1920s and 30s, Stearman wasn't the Kansan aviator making the biggest headlines around the world. That honor went to Amelia Earhart, a fearless aviatrix born here in Atchison, in her grandmother's white frame house. Earhart spent much of her childhood in this home. Perhaps its perch high above the Missouri River is what inspired her to dream of taking flight. Her dream came true in 1921, when she bought her first plane and quickly claimed the title of the first female pilot to ascend to 14,000 feet. She would go on to worldwide fame as the first woman to fly across the Atlantic, the first to do it alone, and the first pilot of either gender to fly solo from Honolulu to Oakland and from Mexico City to Newark. But Earhart's dreams of airborne glory came to a mysterious end on July 2, 1937, 
she disappeared over the Pacific during an attempt to become the first female pilot to fly around the world. Today, she and her adventurous spirit are commemorated just outside Atchison in this massive earthwork by Kansan artist Stan Hurd. Hurd used tractors, plows, lawnmowers, and weed whackers to prepare the ground for this one-acre portrait. Then, he handcrafted Earhart's profile from 50 tons of stone and planted 500 rug junipers and other plants to fill in her goggles and helmet. All to create an earthbound memorial to a high-flying Kansan, which, appropriately enough, is appreciated best from the air. Today, a lot of Kansans have the chance to see it, thanks to an aviation heritage reaching back to pioneers like Earhart and Lloyd Stearman. In 1929, Stearman sold his Wichita factory to Boeing. Over the next two decades, it would go on to build thousands of the biplanes he had designed. Long after production ended, Stearman's sturdy craft still serve as everything from crop dusters to stunt planes. A Stearman biplane even played a starring role in one of Hollywood's most iconic moments, the attempt to murder Cary Grant in a cornfield in Alfred Hitchcock's North by Northwest. But Boeing didn't buy Stearman's factory just to get their hands on his little biplane. The company wanted to expand his plant and use it to build giant commercial and military aircraft. Boeing grew into an international aviation powerhouse and one of the biggest employers in town. But it was just one of many companies making planes here in those days. So many that in 1929, the Aeronautical Chamber of Commerce of the U.S. named Wichita the air capital city. For blues pilgrims, Clarksdale is Mecca. Just outside town, Highway 61 crosses over Highway 49. Legend has it that it was at this crossroads that Delta Blues man Robert Johnson made a deal with the devil, selling his soul in exchange for supernatural guitar skills. The blues grew a reputation for being the devil's music. The idea was that it must be bad for it to sound so good. In the first half of the 20th century, Clarksdale was the big town of the Delta, where folks went to spend money and have a good time. Juke joints filled the town. Many, like Red's Lounge, still operate to this day. Sharecroppers passed through shabby storefronts like this one to hear a new music, an earthy blend of African rhythms, spiritual hymns, and the field haulers of hard labor. It grew out of the darkest reaches of life, but was always balanced by a wry humor. Much of Clarksdale's heritage is housed here at the Delta Blues Museum, located in the old freight depot. It celebrates the musicians who are closely associated with the town. Charlie Patton, Sun House, Robert Johnson, Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker, Sam Cooke, and Ike Turner. Some blues musicians never left the Delta. Others, like Muddy Waters, did. It said he boarded a bus right here at this station and joined the six million other black Southerners in the Great Migration North. I'm going to pack my suitcase, Muddy sang, and make my getaway. The exposure Muddy Waters' music found in Chicago launched the Delta Blues into the mainstream. It's influenced musicians around the world. But it's Clarksdale that remains ground zero for the blues. That's also the name of this blues club, co-owned by actor and Mississippi native Morgan Freeman. Ground Zero sometimes books national acts, but in the Delta, there's always plenty of local talent. It's said that every resident in the state is less than 85 miles from one of four of America's Great Lakes. Erie in the southeast, Huron to its east, Superior to the north, or Michigan on its west coast. Once, this area was covered by a great sheet of ice called the Wisconsin Glacier. After that ice melted roughly 14,000 years ago, Paleo-Indians arrived. 
they hunted mastodons and mammoths, caribou and beaver. More recently, descendants of these early tribes explored the area's waterways in dugout canoes, fishing the many inlets that still line Michigan's coast today. From the air, this is as varied a shoreline as any in North America. Endless beaches, remote pine forests that reach right down to the water, miles of marsh, and a giant wall of sand towering above Lake Michigan. It's called Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore and is often ranked among the nation's tallest sand dunes. But that's not quite accurate. This isn't a typical dune. The sand on its surface actually rests atop a bluff of rock and gravel left by a glacier, which is why it's called a perched dune. But scientists say that it may not be perched here for long. Westerly winds off Lake Michigan are moving Sleeping Bear Dune inland at an average rate of two feet per year. It's 450 feet high from top to bottom. Climbing back up can be hard work. Pulitzer Prize winning author Carl Sandburg has said that these dunes are to the Midwest what the Grand Canyon is to Arizona and the Yosemite to California, a signature of time and eternity.